Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol 10 8, two man car. Eddie, are you reporting? Are you 10 8, Eddie? I am 10 8, Jess, and I'm reporting for duty, sir. This is Catholic Briefing, Catholic Intel, Catholic Roll Call. We got a great show today because uh, we've got uh, what I would consider, Eddie, we got one of the SWAT guys with us. Yeah, we Spiritual do. We got, we got some, we, tactics. Yeah, we got somebody on our six today. That's great. Dan, yeah. how are you, sir? It's Eddie Chavez. I haven't had the pleasure yet. How are you? Eddie. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. How are you today? Good, sir. Good. Hey, Dan, we want to just start off real quick uh, with you obviously know that there's an article out there. A Catholic priest, uh, the uh, Superior General of the Jesuits, Father Arturo Sosa, and uh, he recently made a, a controversial comment. He said that the devil exists as a symbolic reality, not as a personal reality. He received a, a cataclysmic amount of, of, of emails, specifically from the International Organization of Catholic Exorcists, that corrected him. And they said that he, his remarks are outside the ordinary and the extraordinary solemn magisterium of the church. So, uh, Dan, why would somebody say this? And what would be your response to somebody who's actually hands-on doing hand-to-hand -hand combat in the field of healing, deliverance, and exorcism? What would you respond to him? Yeah, I think it, um, it was very interesting. I saw the article, and then within 24 hours, the, uh, the International Association of Exorcists responded very clearly and very succinctly that, that this is absolutely uh, not Catholic teaching. I think uh, Father Sosa is, is speculating um, on, on evil, the source of evil. But again, it goes back to what we've talked about before. The three modernism. Of, if you look at modernism. Right, and the heresy of modernism. Truth. Absolutely. And how do we combat that? One of the things that, that, I, that I've always been, been really pushing is we have to go back to classical theology, what we call rest, you know, uh, uh, reclamation theology. Classical theology takes three steps. You go and you, you find something such as the, the value of evil. I mean the, the person of evil, the, the mystery of evil. You look into scriptures. You look into the tradition. The second step is very important. This is where Father Sosa makes his mistakes. He, he does not pl apply the second step, which is to uh, compare the data with the analogy of faith. Is this con consistent with the Vincentian canon? Is that which was believed everywhere always by everyone from the beginning. And so from the beginning, if you go back to the patristic, the patristic thought going all the way back, you see the writings against evil, evil practices and Satan as a, as a person, the devil as, a, as an entity, a personal entity. And I mean that as a person. A personification with, with of evil. Faculty. It's not just a person, not, not, just, not just a symbolic personification, right. but an actual a person. person. An actual yes. person. A person. And, 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 and so this is where he, he errors because the catechism states very clearly we're, de we're dealing – we're dealing, as St. Paul says, not with flesh and blood, with powers and principalities. And the fallen angels, including Lucifer, the first to fall, and those third that went with him, according to the, the tradition of the church, this is where he errors by speculating outside of the bounds of what the catechism calls and the, the, theologians call the, the analogy of faith. Is this consistent with what has been taught? By, and handed down by Christ and, and his successor apostles. Uh, and, and what he said is not consistent, not obviously. Consistent. Let me ask you a question. Would it be a fair statement to say that Father Sosa has never participated as a participant or a spectator, as an intercessor, or an assistant in an exorcism? He wouldn't have said this had, he's ever, had he ever participated in an exorcism, minor or major. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a very fair statement. I think, it's again, it's speculation. Um, based based upon some some assumptions that are contrary to say uh, you know classical theology Catholic assumptions, um, it's taking psychological. What it's doing is imbuing theology with a, with a, a, a modern psychological approach to the human person, um, and this is where the error takes place. And if you've ever again, um, you know you guys are cops, you've been face to face with some really evil people. Jesse, I've read your book. Oh yeah, wonderful book. 
Oh yeah. Uh, you know, you 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 tell the story of encountering true evil, and when you encounter that in your story, you in your book you talk about you try you tried to get these guys to say the name of Jesus, uh, Jesus is Lord. Some of these criminals, and they could not say it. So it isn't some it isn't some symbolic evil that pre- prevents them from from saying the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is a physical entity that is taking possession of them. And if you go – and anyone that's ever participated in a solemn exorcism or even in, even in a minor exorcism, you know the presence is evil. You know the presence is not just a symbolic meta- metaphorical uh, 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 wandering from the idealistic state of humanity if we would all just live as social justice warriors correctly. We're up against flesh – we're up against – not flesh and blood, but true evil in a personified form in the fallen angels. And the catechism has, has been very clear on this, and this is what's been taught from the beginning. Eddie, you got a question? Uh, you know, just I'm just amazed at how somebody so, so educated like Father Sosa, you know, he's a pontifical licentiate in philosophy, a doctorate in political science, how somebody can use education to, uh, to, to, to really kind of... Uh, Throw a game at at at, at the at the, at the uh, Catholic public. This is very, and I'm not, I'm sure maybe it's not intentional. I, I I can't make that judgment, but it's just amazing to see somebody's education like that uh, to to draw them away from what classical Catholic thought really is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan, I got another question real quick. Let me jump in here. Got a question. I was asked uh, today by a, a a good Catholic, and he told me to ask you since you're going to be on the air. Is it proper for us as Catholics, or does it, does it matter for us to say that our, our the three enemies of the soul are the devil, the world, and the flesh, or is it the world, the devil, and the flesh? Does it matter in what order you say it, or is there a hierarchy of evil when we talk about the three enemies of the soul? Yeah, I've never I've never considered the question, but I think traditionally the triad goes: the world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay. Um, but and it's and it's but if you if you understand the fall of humanity, the commonality between man and the serpent is dirt, right? On your belly you shall crawl, dirt you shall eat, right? To the man, um, dirt you shall you are dirt you shall return to dirt, and through the sweat of your brow from the dirt you shall draw forth fruit from the earth. So the commonality between us and the fallen angels is this world, is this flesh. And that's what the devil himself has access to, um, to the, which is why we need, to, we need to reject the world, renounce the world. We're in the world but not of the world, and we have to, we have to work against, militating against the desires of the flesh, St. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 6. You know, who will deliver me from this body of death? What I want to do, I don't do. What I do, I don't want to do, etc. Thanks be to God. Praise be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's through our union with Christ a sacramental union with Christ in, the, in and through the church that we can live otherworldly, that we can transcend the desires of the flesh and therefore defeat the devil in our lives. So I think what, what, what order you put them in is to, mis, is to misunderstand the basic. I don't think it matters. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. That's what I told my friend. I, I generally usually say the devil, the world, and the flesh. Uh, I, I, and I, the reason I say that because we know from St. Thomas Aquinas that God is the first cause of everything, and the devil, Lucifer, pre-existed the, the, the foundation of the world. And so even, God is even the first cause of Lucifer, so that, therefore I usually say his name first, the devil, the world, uh, and the flesh, because uh, the world came before in the order of creation. It, it came before man, and man didn't come till the sixth day. So I try to follow the Genesis account. Uh, the, the angels were created first, and then the, the cosmos, and then... Uh, Adam and Eve. So I don't know if I'm right or not, or, or, does, or does it even matter? I don't think it really matters. I, th- I think the, the three, just in, the, in, in Catholic tradition, those are seen as the three enemies of the soul. And we see the commonality is the devil. Um, but at the same time, the world militates against Christians. The world militates against the flesh. Um, and so the three, the three, the, the, these are the three traditional enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that's just kind of the, again, that's kind of the formula, the formulaic triad that they place them in. I'm not sure it matters. Dan, I'm Eddie asked me a good question last three. week, and I said, well, we're going to have to ask Dan. What, what, it was that, what was it, Eddie? Yeah, Dan, this is what I want to ask you. And, you know, we're coming up on a break here pretty quick, but let, let me get the question out, and then you can, you can answer it if you can. Uh, so, so what are the boundaries in, in spiritual warfare as far as, 
disembodied human spirits. So I know that sometimes it, it, it takes a diagnostic or, or it takes you know the the first portion of, of, of a ritual to to determine you know what exactly you're dealing with here. Uh, but what uh, what what is what is the uh, what are the boundaries? In other words, what can a disembodied human spirit do that a demon cannot do? Is there is there uh, you know can they harass, oppress, possess? What what is it? Yeah, it, because I think the the, the question also we're we're talking is that in the in the actual exorcism of Annalise Michelle in the transcripts there were six demons in her in her body and they were saying I'm the spirit of Hitler, I'm the spirit of Judas, I'm the spirit of Caesar. So I think the question is, can these damn spirits possess a human being, or 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 what's the answer? Yeah, there is no. We're, we're moving into speculative theology, and there's and there's there's going to be disagreement even among learned exorcists. Um, I've heard exorcists that I respect completely differ on this. Some will say yes, I've encountered disembodied spirits. Others will point to the Praetor Tundra of the, of the Rite of Exorcism, Char written by Charles Borromeo, saying that if a disembodied spirit uh, presents itself, reject it, do not, do, not, do not go down there. Basically, it's a rabbit hole because you can't tell. Is it Judas or is it the spirit behind Judas? We all know that one of the prevalent, if not the prevalent spirit in the modern age is the spirit of Jezebel. We all recognize the Jezebel spirit, but is it actually Jezebel or is it the spirit that was that was manipulating and using her and possessing her, so to speak. Well, okay. We can come back to that after the break. Yeah, we'll come back after the break. Thanks, Dan. We'll uh, be listening to Jesus 911. We're talking to Dan Snyder. We'll be right back. This is Barbara Nicolosi, and we're having a women's conference here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in Covina on September 7th, 2019. This is going to be a great, great day for you to come and meet a bunch of new friends, wonderful Catholic women who want to deepen their Catholic faith and their understanding of themselves as women. You know, this era right now that we're in, so much confusion. What is it to be a man? What is it to be a woman? You know, the Catholic Church has a lot to say about this, and we're going to hear about them. We're going to hear about John Paul II's letter on women that he wrote from Mary Danielle Barber. He's going to talk about that. She's going to talk about Mary as a model for all of us. It's a topic that we can never reflect on too much. I'm going to talk about Teresa of Avila and the interior castle and how a mystical marriage is what all of us should be called to, or are called to, as Catholics in our prayer lives, and especially as women in the church. Aileen Blakowski is going to talk about motherhood and homeschooling. And then Father, we have, uh, finally, we have Father Charles Murray. He's going to be the celebrant of the Eucharist. He's going to be here hearing confessions. It's going to be an amazing day. We're going to have an hour of adoration together, time to pray, time to laugh, and eat, reflect, uh, grow in our passion for our Catholic faith and our identity as Catholic women. You don't want to miss it. You want to come. You want to bring your friends. You want to bring your daughters, your nieces. That's really an affordable day. So go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and you can register for this conference or call 877-526-2151. Uh, the Women's Conference is going to be a great event for the Archdiocese of, of Los Angeles area, Southern California Catholics. You don't want to miss it. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Three-man card. Call letters John 316. We got Dan Schneider on. Ten eight, ten giving eight. us some special weapons and tactics training. <coughs> Dan, as, you were, as we were yes. talking about, uh, the, the question was, and you said exorcist, Defer, you got good exorcists on both sides of the camp? 
uh, on the issue of damned spirits being able to possess uh, a human person, but you actually kind of answered it because you said in the introduction to the Roman ritual, it, it, you have the introduction, which goes by a Latin phrase uh, that you just mentioned, then you got chapter two and chapter three. What's the name of Latin that the introduction goes by? The Prayed No Tundra. No tundra. It's Prayed No Tundra. Preparatory remarks. So you're saying that St. Charles Borromeo in the preparatory remarks, he answers that question. Right. It, it just, it doesn't, he doesn't speculate on it. It just says ignore it. And so oh. because, because I've seen, I've seen, I've seen demons present themselves as disembodied spirits, and it's just to try to chase the exorcist and the team down into a rabbit hole. Ah, because got it. That makes it. sense. That's what I was thinking. So, yeah, this is, this is Aunt Tilly. This is your grandmother. So right. now, next thing you know, you're out of the, you're out of your armor of spiritual, uh, of, of spiritual weaponry, and you get sucked into a battle of, well, let's talk about your aunt Tilly. Let's talk about how your, <laughs> yeah. let's talk about your relationship with your father. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, now you're getting into psychotherapy, and the demon beats you because you're not going to, you're not going to psychoanalyze the demon. He's too smart. So, so your, your, the, the safest weaponry is just to, it's, it's a, it's a pickaxe and a sledgehammer that you're just grinding away trying to free free souls from the grips of Satan. Oh, I wanted to respond back one real quick, Jesse, on the, the triad yeah. of the world of flesh and the devil. I think okay. the tradition goes back to Scripture, and that's the order in which Christ was tempted by Satan. He was first offered, um, you know, cast himself off the pinnacle for the world, you know, the, the, that the world will be his, the dominions will be yours, turn fle- the stones into bread, the flesh, and then worship Satan in the end. Oh, okay. That's where the... the that's where I think that's where traditionally I just thought about that during the break. Got it. Yeah, so, you're right. The so temptation of Christ is world, flesh, and then devil. Okay. Yeah, okay, well, that answers that. I need you to be the one yeah. to ask. <laughs> hey, yeah. Dan, let's start going. Yeah. Eddie, me want to start going and ask him some questions about uh, uh, the whole issue of, of authority. And we want to just share some snippets from Father Ripperger's book, Deliverance Prayers, because he answers this, but we just want to just share a snippet and have you comment on it. Uh, let me, here's the first one I want just, I just want to read here and I kind of marked it off. Uh, so Eddie knows where I'm going. I'm in the second paragraph, Eddie. It says, as for the authority, the church has observed that the laity do not have the right to use certain prayers because they do not have the requisite authority for their use. Okay. So what is father Ripperger talking about there in that sentence? In, in pre- uh, that the imprecatory please. prayers, correct? I'll read it again. He's talking about imprecatory prayers. Yeah. As for, the, as for authority, the church has observed that the lady do not have the right to use certain prayers because they do not have the requisite authority for their use. Then he, he, Father Ripperger writes, here we're thinking of the 1984 document from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, um, de ab aloquet anis, it, it, where it says, it follows also from these same prescriptions that Christ faithful may not employ the formula of exorcism against Satan and the fallen angels which is ex- excerpted from that formula made official by the order of the Supreme Pontiff, Leo the Thirteenth, and certainly may not use the entire text of that exorcism. So as I read it correct, it says that lay people can't use, obviously, the long-form St. Michael the Archangel prayer, and they can't use imprecatory prayers, but they can use deprecatory prayers. Is that correct? That is correct. Think of Let's, let's start with the first. Let's start with the, the why, why lay people should not use the the Leonine or the 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 the, 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 Leon, the Pope Leo or the Michael prayer against fallen angels, which is a very popular prayer, um, because it's embedded into a, a Roman ritual, which is only uh, which is only granted to a priest properly uh, author, uh, authorized and deputed by his local ordinary, and to use that. Therefore, it's, it is not to be used by lay people. Um, that's that's the that's. Speaking liturgically and canonically, this is this is the main argument on why we should not use that prayer. Um, think practically speaking. Think of that prayer as a as a high flash weapon. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's a weapon that puts that's got a huge muzzle blast. So if you use that weapon, it's very very effective. But if you're using it outside of authority, and now that the the church has taught against the you know through the CDF that's using it. You may or may not attract a fallen angel that's going to retaliate against you for using it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're legalistic, and they know that you don't have the authority to say that prayer. Correct? You don't have the authority. Exactly. Well, and, and also, it's, it's like, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's a high, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, 
a, a very advanced weapon that you use at, in certain times. So if you're using it outside its normal use, then uh, th then it loses its eff efficiency. Right. But an equally powerful prayer, and, this, and stay with me, an equally powerful prayer is prayed by a man, a father, as head of household, who blesses his children with a, with a formula that says, as head of household, as authority of Jesus Christ given to me as head of household through divine positive law, in the name of God the Father Almighty, I bless this child, and I command that any demons from afflicting this child or this, this flesh of my wife's, I command any demon afflicting us to leave now. That is, that is as effective as any, as any other formulaic prayer given to, to the given for a priest to pray because we have that authority in our home. And the demons know that. They would much rather us draw us out of our authority and use weapons that, that we should not be using than us to understand our, our God-given dignity, right, and authority as head of household as men. And Good teaching stuff. others to do that is much more effective than me picking up that weapon and trying to alleviate their suffering in a short term, right? It, 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 it might alleviate some suffering in the short term, but in the long term, I'm doing nothing to help them continuate the militation against evil in their lives. It's, it's, it, it's what Bonhoeffer would call cheap grace. We're looking for a quick fix. Right, right. We're looking for deliverance. That, you know what I mean? It doesn't work that way. You spent 20 years getting your life into this diabolic mess and yes. entanglement. It's going to take some time for you to work your way out of it. It's not a magic wand. That's what we often say. It's not a magic not wand. A magic you, wand. you can't say a couple of, uh, of, of St. Michael prayers and, and be, be a return to your, your previous life. Dan, let me ask you a quick question. So where does, when does this authority, uh, how would I say, where does this authority lose its, its efficiency? In other words, once the children are old and they start their own household, right, that's, that's, that's probably the uh, breaking point. The breaking point there. Right. So, so what you what we see is, you know, when we get when we get inquiries from cases, people that are afflicted, it's not just the individual. You'll notice there is there is normally, this is just again, this is just a phenomenon de facto observation from the battlefield. I'm just a cavalry scout reporting the battlefield, what's going on. But reporting for duty, sir. <laughs> that's it. I'm just calling in, man. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just calling in to tell you, telling the general, hey, this is how many guys there are. I'm not going to tell you how to fight the battle. I'm just going to tell you what's out there yeah, exactly. and, uh, and what the enemy's doing, where they're staging, what the uniforms look like, if they look hungry, if they look scared, you know. But uh, um, so, so understanding. Now I lost my train of thought. No, we asked about um, the uh, where does the authority break at? At some point, the family starts. Uh, oh, the son so starts his own family. They come to us. They, they. I mean. Often, more than half the time, there is a child in the home that, that is approaching a sacramental year. So because we go back, if you go back to that document, um, the CDF put out, Cardinal Ratzinger, 29 September 1985, um, he talks about um, pastors um, should recall the tradition of the church concerning the role proper of the sacraments. He's talking about lay people and deliverance and laying of hands, etc. The role of the sacraments. The intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and the angels and saints in Christian spiritual battle against evil spirit. This is what is deficient in, in most deliverance models that are out there because our sacramental orientation is what, is what we primarily are oriented to God, and through that, grace flows into our lives. And so you're going to see that when there is an attack against a family, a curse is being called out by, by a diabolic spirit. It's usually it's usually at a time when the, uh, when there's a child approaching confirmation, first communion, etc. So so that being um, um, that being said, it's it's um, as they, and as they if if the child, for example, coming to confirmation, as going back to your question, Eddie, as they approach confirmation, as the child approach Christian adulthood, remember the language and the and the thinking of the church. This child now becomes a soldier, a warrior. If yes. you can take that. A warrior for Christ, right? This is this is what the church teaches. If you can get a, if you can get that warrior in a state of mortal sin Off the before they're confirmed, you can you can you can mitigate their effectiveness on the battlefield. So oftentimes before confirmation, you'll see this because and also the authority of the parents will gradually once they reach confirmation, their authority is still there, but it begins it begins to sh a slow shift. Into the authority of counsel before they're confirmed, the parent the parents have have 
total authority, and it begins to, it begins to slow down. Father Ripperger, there's there's resources on our on the Libra Cristo webpage, um, and Father Ripperger, there's there's videos that Father Ripperger has put out on this. Um, and if you go to the conference uh, talks, Father Ripperger has a spends one day talking about authority, this very issue, and and then familiar authority. So um, this is a key issue, understanding our authority. Um, um, and as they as they grow into their own sacramental uh, vocational sacrament, our authority lessens even further. So that doesn't mean we stop praying for them, but that but that our first duty and our primary authority is is to our children, our spouse for our spouses first, our children in the home, and then the adult children outside of the home. That would be where our authority. Um, that would be the lines of our authority. Okay, and you know that that, that makes total sense because. And it's funny that you mentioned this on the very day of orientation. We have confirmation tonight that that we're 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 starting at a new parish, and uh, you mentioned it today. But yeah, uh, you know when you have when you have a, a parent when this child is is a teenager, uh, they're they're trying not to be so forceful. They're like you say they're trying to blend in with with what the the, the teenagers hearing, uh, you know, uh, in social media and, and and what they're hearing at school. So that there's a little bit of backing off. And so uh, what I hear you saying is that, hey, our authority doesn't ever leave. You can use some uh, 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 tactics to, to keep the child engaged, but don't let them go entirely un, un, until, they do, until they do leave. Right. And, 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 and getting us to understand authority, too, it isn't, it isn't I'm the man and I'm going to tell you you're going to wear this shirt. We're going to eat this today right. for dinner. It's, that, that, that's machismo. That is, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a man's primary orientation towards evil vis-a-vis his family. Does he stand between his wife Eve and the serpent and saying, over my dead body? And does he, does he offer those prayers, sacrifices, sufferings, uh, reparation for his family? And, and, and when he prays against the evil one, this is one of the things the evil one doesn't want us to know, that our, our authority in our home is is extremely powerful. It's given to us by God. We reflect God and in, in the authority structure in our home. And so, orienting our prayers and not just oh, you know, here we are in the feast of Saint Augustine and, and Monica. In, in her prayers who, at the beginning, who knows? We don't know. But if those prayers for our children, especially those who have strayed, we'll come back to that. So I'm going to get yeah. into the emotionality yeah. of prayer and why it's important to, to, and how to pray more. Yeah, we'll get back. Hold yeah. that thought. Uh, at, very good. Jesus 911. We'll be right back. Hey guys, 10 8. Be right back. We got Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment. You know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You That's know, right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this, and I just want to call all the people, you know, I've got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money, and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless because you, I, brother. You're amazing. We got to. We have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the Divine Mercy Chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 30 years old 29 years old. Five kids, and I thank you guys. But everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I no love it. Out there. This is Terry Barber reminding you there's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019, at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity. Be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Pen 8, three-man car. We got uh, Jess and Ed and, and Dan. We're talking about spiritual warfare topics. Dan, can you sum up your answer that you were talking about on the last segment real quick about authority? Then I want to pick your brain about something else on Father Ripperger's book. But go ahead and finish up that last answer on authority. You're doing a bang-up job. Yeah, the authority begins. Our own authority, lay people, is in, is it um, stays with on our. It 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 flows from our sacramental orientation to God. So for a lay person, the boundaries of that imprecatory authority is in our home. That doesn't mean we don't have authority as Christians. It just means that 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 authority lessens as we get out of our own familial constructs. Um, and then the priestly authority is 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 different than than lay authority. Their authority. Um, is deputed from the local ordinary, and that there flows from him. And that authority is universal because they are priests, ordained ministers of the living God. So their authority, the authority lines differently. Our authority, think of this, in deliverance ministry, in deliverance ministry, um, there is charism. And there are authentic charisms out there, but they're often misused. What makes us effective as lay people in deliverance ministry, isn't our intelligence, it isn't our charisms, it's purity and thought, word, and deed. And purity and thought, word, and deed, and, and obedience to local authority, the, the priest we're working with, working in union with the local bishop, that purifies any charisms that may be present. It's through that obedience and purity of thought, word, and deed that we're able to be more effective in the ministry. And if you are not pure, if you have, if, if you have a, a, if you're contracepting and you have unconfessed mortal sin, and, and you're living a life contrary to the faith of the Catholic Church, and you're, procl- and you're using the name of Jesus to drive out demons, you are very attractive and very vulnerable, attractive to the demons and very vulnerable at this point. So it's going to be through purity, thought, word, and deed, that we're going to be effective and protective in this ministry. Dan, Dan you kept mentioning something at the lectures a couple of weeks ago at the Liber Crystal lectures. You mentioned it. Kyle mentioned it. Father Ripperger mentioned it. You guys were saying the demon enters through sin, but remains through heresy. Unpeel that for us. The demon enters through sin, but remains through heresy. Can you unpack that? Yes. Oftentimes, um, well, let me start with an extreme case, because sometimes in the extreme cases we can see um, the demons work and plan in our own lives. This is, another, this is just another battlefield report from an old cavalry scout. In every case of diabolic possession, there is a Marian defect. There is somewhere along the – there's somewhere in their thinking there's a rejection of a Marian dogma. Mm. So that observation has led us to find further observations about the presence of heresy. So the, the, the demon enters through sin. It might be the sin of another. Oftentimes if you have a child who is molested, uh, especially if it's an incestual molestation by a father who abdicates his parental – God-given authority and uses it for evil, um, you know, cases of satanic ritual abuse. There's, there's all sorts of entry points, entry going into witchcraft, getting away from the sacraments. You commit a sin, the sin of not going to mass and going to the curandera. The, the entry point is going to be a sin, and it's oftentimes it's either avoiding, avoidance of the cross or, a, uh, or some, some violation of the first commandment, again, seeking false gods. But the holding point. The holding point, there's always an element of heresy, of false teaching. And what is the mark of the of, – of what is the mark, what is the, the operant word in the definition of heresy from the catechism? It's obstinacy. There is some obstinate holding. Now, heresy can be breaking – can be broken down. Think of it as the, the climbing wall. If you're going to climb a cliff or you go to the National Guard has got their climbing wall out there at the local fair, 
you, you can climb that wall in two ways. You've got rocks protruding outward, and you've got crevices going inward. The rocks protruding outward are going to be, by analogy, uh, formal heresy, a rejection of some doctrine of the faith. And I, I've heard it all. I can bless my own holy water. I don't have to go to Mass on Sunday, but I go on Thursdays, and that's good enough for me. I don't need to confess my sins to a priest. You know, I, can, I go directly to God. These are just heresies, direct violations of the teaching of the church. The crevices that you can put your hand or feet into to continue to hold is, are ignorances. So ignorance is about the truth of the faith, not understanding that this is a mortal sin and not confessing it, um, not understanding that – and it isn't maybe even anything too intellectual. Not understanding that you're beloved by God, you're a child of God, that God wants to heal and, and deliver you. That God, you know, so there could be some – there's always some element there, and this is what our faith too, the Freedom Through Christ protocol works, is to identify those areas of life where there is intellectual breakdown and there's a holding of some heresy because the demon is right behind that. He's right behind that. The devil is not a, not a, not a creature or a person. The devil is, a, is just a systematic expression, et cetera. You see, I mean, the demon is right there behind those false statements. That, that makes sense. But, just, uh, or, yeah. excuse me, just, that makes sense why there's usually at some point in every uh, exorcism or, or, or healing, uh, the Virgin Mary is somehow present at those. That makes total sense then. If there's yeah. some, if there's some, yeah. if, you know, right? If there's some deficiency in their understanding about the Blessed Virgin, that that makes sense that she might uh, come to their aid uh, during the ritual, etc. Yeah, the exorcist will tell you that she's present at every extraction. At every extraction, wow. the Virgin Mary is present because she was the one. She was the one prophesied in Genesis three fifteen, what we call the the co uh, predestination. Of Jesus and Mary, she was predestined. She was chosen from the beginning, prophesied from Genesis 3:15, to be to be immaculately pure. And through her, the Redeemer would 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 crush the head of Satan. So so it's she she is she is God's perfect creature. What's interesting is I gave a talk at a parish not long ago, and it was absolutely packed. There was, I mean it was it was full capacity on spiritual warfare. A year prior, I was at the same parish, and I gave a three three sessions on Mariology. The first session, we got 12 people. The second week, eight showed up. The third week, nobody showed up, so I locked the door and left. And I was thinking to myself, if you would only come and hear the power of the Virgin Mary, and you would conform your life to her and consecrate to her and devote daily prayers to her, consecrate everything in the Montfortian manner, consecrate to the Virgin Mary, live fully as a, as a son and daughter of her, you wouldn't have to figure out how to get the devil out of your life because she would do, do it for you. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it's easy to be fascinated with what the evil one is doing. It's a lot harder to live as a son or daughter of Mary and conform yourself completely in obedience to her and live as a son and daughter of the church. Consecrate all of our temporal goods, all of our spiritual goods, everything to Christ through her. That's where spiritual effectiveness in the battlefield really comes to. Well, I'll never make that mistake again. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that, Dan. <laughs> Dan, I, I, I was uh, provide, talking to the other layer of armor. You know, I mean, she, she's a, she's body armor. She's spiritual body armor. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? You see these SWAT guys is a stand down, right, at, in a at a bad guy's house in a the neighborhood. They don't walk in there and and they're sitting in flip flops. These guys go head to toe. They're armored up. You know what I mean? Kevlar helmets. They got they they, they cover every inch of their body. Sure. This is Marian. This is Marian consecration. It's covering our souls. With a layer of Kevlar, spiritual Kevlar, that gives us protection against evil, and then we have the courage and the confidence to go in and kick doors in and do what we got to do. Amen. Amen. Man, this this is not to pick on anybody else. I'm not going to mention any names, but this is the deficiency in other deliverance models in the Catholic Church. There is no Marian component. Yeah. Number one, there is no reference to the sacraments or drawing. The penitent, the victim, the anergumen, the patient, whatever you want to call it, no drawing them to the sacraments, no sacramental grace being mentioned or, or talked about. And also there's no distinction between the priesthood, the ministerial priesthood, and the lay priesthood. There's no distinction. It's like we're, it's, it's a Lutheran understanding. It's, it's, it's all the yeah. universal priesthood. So that's the deficiency in these other, no reference to sacramentals. Uh, but going back to that question, right. that that statement about demons enter through sin, and and but they remain there through heresy. 
this one uh, this one young guy, he had called me up and he had asked me, and he, he was very honest. He listened to the show and he said his wife uh, was going through a couple of sessions in an undisclosed diocese in this big country of ours. And uh, and he says that she's already gone through half a dozen sessions. And he told me, I'm listening to your show. Somebody told me to listen to it. And I heard Dan Schneider and something pricked my interest about demons don't leave through heresy. He says, I just recently found out, me and my wife just recently found out we're in our mid-30s. We're coming back to our church as a result of this, these, uh, in, this uh, the, my, my wife being spiritually afflicted. Uh, and uh, it, it happened through... Uh, having a, a mason, 33rd mason in the family line, and uh, it, it, the, it fell upon her, the spiritual affliction. But he had told me, he says, uh, if we're contracepting, he says, do you think my wife can be healed? I said, that's something I would take to the exorcist. Uh, because now, I said, when did you find out that contraception is not allowed? He goes, I just found out about it. He goes, I'm in my mid-30s. He goes, now it's like I've, I've read it. It's in the catechism. I, I've come back to my faith. It's clear. I said, okay. Uh, now that you know that it's wrong, I said, now that you're, now you're culpable, okay, because you have full knowledge. And so you need to take this to the priest that's, that, that's uh, taking the, that's seeing your wife, and uh, you're going to have to make sure that you guys change this practice because, in my opinion, from what I've learned from uh, you know, smarter people than myself, that liber Christu, and now that you know it's wrong and they're doing sessions on her, uh, the the demon won't leave if you're if you're obstinate against the church's teaching, saying, "Well, you know, I discovered what the church teaches, but I don't care. We're going to still do it, and 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 uh, who cares?" Uh, so I told him, "Make sure you start taking NFP classes. Get rid of the jams, jellies, and plugs. Conform to the church's teachings, and I think your wife, uh, it'll be a lot easier for her because now you 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 re- you removed the all the obstacles of sanctifying grace." And I said, "I think she'll be healed a lot faster." Uh, did I tell him? Did I give him the right ad- advice, Dan? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before the develop, it was it was because of these things, because of two principal points that that the society and Father Ripinger developed the the Libra Cristo protocol. One is the element the elements of heresy. If you don't clean up, you know what does Saint Paul say? Be transformed by the renewal of your minds. The, the, the ultimate battle is is to take control of the intellect, and if we have if we have willful obstinacy against the teachings of the church, the demon is going to hold there. But also, uh, several times when we go into session, I would sit down. Again, I'm the cat scout. I'm laying up the battlefield. Uh, I'm getting the, I'm getting the person ready. And I said, "Did you go to mass last week?" Well, no. Damn, hold the thought. Hold the thought. Well, it's good. It's the, hold the thought, Dan. Eddie. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with Dan Snyder with more of spiritual warfare. Don't leave us. We'll be right back. This is Mary Danielle Barber, and I would like to invite you to join us here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in downtown Covina for a true femininity, be who you are, women's conference, Saturday, September 7, 2019, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Barbara Nicolosi and I will be speaking. It's $35 a person, and you can register at virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877 877- Five two six two one five one. We hope to see you at the Women's Conference, September 7, 2019. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church, to aid and defend her.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Welcome to High Intel Catholicism. We got uh, three warriors for Christ, three wogs. <laughs> Dan, we were talking about uh, you were you were talking about uh, responding about the uh, the uh, the way demons remain through heresy they they don't have to leave they're legalistic they know when when you have when you have obstinate refusal in your mind to submit to the church's teachings you're not renewing your mind in Christ as St Paul says they don't have to leave continue with that answer yeah i want to read a quote from a famous famous foot soldier warrior for christ it says this living in a state of grace basically means imitating jesus christ and cultivating the interior life the only possible way to live in a state of grace is through him, with him, and in him. Jesse Romero, right? You remember writing that? <laughs> yeah, I the do. State of grace is the found, it's the foundation for liberation. And if we go into and pray for a soul, I would sit down and say, hey, did you go to Mass this weekend? Oh, I didn't. Have you been to confession? Well, I didn't. You're actually doing an injustice to that soul. If this soul is in a state of mortal sin, and you go in there with the power of the church, with or without authority, and you pound the demon, and you will pound the demon. In other models, you're pounding the demon, but you're doing a disservice to the soul because what the demon does, he takes his lick in, but then once you're gone, he goes back, and he pounds that soul further for calling you in. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like you have a, you know, the, 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 a sister or a friend who is being, who's being abused, beat up by her boyfriend. You go beat the boyfriend up. But she is in no state to throw – no condition to throw him out. She's not ready to throw him out. What's going to happen? The minute you leave, here it comes again. So, so living in the state of grace is absolutely essential. There's nothing sexy about the Libra Cristo model. It is just grinded out Catholicism, identifying defects, identifying her- heretical things being held, and purifying them. And the growth in purity – and the orient, reorientation to Christ. Remember the Catholic definition of liberation. It's, it, it, is the, it is reconciliation to the Father through Christ in the sacraments. It's the sacraments, as you, as you alluded to, Jesse. Some of the other models don't emphasize the sacraments. They don't emphasize the destroyer of heresies, the Virgin Mary, Virgin Most Powerful. They don't emphasize the saints and the angels, the sacramentals. They're going into battle with a very limited arsenal and a dangerous one at that if they're outside of authority. Another thing is is coming to what we call the three R's. In your, in your book, you've got the four R's. You've got, you've got the repent, renounce, resist, and renew. And yeah. It's very, very similar to what, to what we've developed, how the Ripager has developed. In phase two, reject, rebuke, and renounce. Part of, part of confessing, like the young man you mentioned, he's got to confess. He's got to confess that sin, right, of practicing contraception, contraception. but then going back, rejecting, re, renew, re, rebuking, renouncing, all those areas of life, that we have allowed Satan into our homes, into our families, into our sexual lives, into our bedrooms, into our business practices, et cetera. Eddie? Just, uh, I'm not sure if you see the uh, the board. We have a call from uh, John. Okay. Uh, well, uh, John Bedard. Oh, John Bedard? Do okay. we, do we lose him? Go right now? back. Okay, we lost him. That's Dan, okay. Let me, let me ask you a question. Other models... Like you said, they go and they'll pray over somebody and they pound away. And, you know, they, they, they obviously are doing damage to the demon. And maybe the person, the demon may even leave. I don't know, for a time. And uh, the person may find some relief. But the danger in other models I find is that when you're just praying for people that are in mortal sin without preparing them, because you haven't removed those, those, uh, those blocks to sanctifying grace. So you're praying over somebody who has mortal sin, you're agitating the demon, and, and the Bible's very clear about not praying uh, over people with mortal sin. It says in 1 John five sixteen, if anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. I do not say that one is to pray for that. 
So the Bible's yeah. pretty clear that you can't, you know, if you're going to be praying for somebody in mortal sin, the Scripture says not to do that uh, because, again, they don't have— they don't have the ability to receive sanctifying grace in that condition. And so all you're doing is agitating the demon, pounding away at the demon. And again, I don't know, the demon may leave, but he's going to come back angrier once you stop praying for him. Isn't, isn't that what you just basically uh, said? Or, or, they're going to, or they're going to send in a guy that has the authority to counter your lack of authority. Uh, so Stronger that, that, demons. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Dan, so Dan, so the reason the, I'm sorry. The, the the reason that yeah, one is able ahead. to pound the demons is because you have a certain power based on our our, our Christian baptism, baptism and confirmation. Yeah, we have because we have some of the sacraments. But but if you're in a state of mortal sin, then it's kind of like a, a retro a retro punishment that your your uh, the, the disservice is a retro punishment by the demon after you're gone. Is is that pretty close? Exactly. There's two, there's two words. Let me let me let me give you. There's two two steps to my thought. One is. In, in Luke 9, 1, Christ gave to the 12 power and authority. The Christians received power. Dunamis is the Greek word. The, the word for authority is exousia. Literally, it's from the being, right? It's out of the being. So, so the priest's ontological being is conformed to Christ sacramentally and ontologically, and from that flows the ability to drive out demons, heal the sick, okay. and, to, and to preach, it says in, in Luke 9, 1 to 2, given to the 12. Now, we have power. We have power as Christians, and we have authority, and all, all we're saying is that your authority should be exercised um, in right order and, as God given us through our, our vocational sacraments and natural law. Now, one of the reasons that we found in moving to this model, and most of us that evolved at Libra Cristo and Freedom Through Christ have worked in other models, charismatic models and other systematic models, uh, programmatic models. But two things kept recurring, two things, regardless of all the different models, two phenomenon that we see. One is recidivism, and the second is retaliation. So the recidivism is if you're praying for a soul that's not in the state of mortal, a state of grace, as, as I quoted from Jesse's book, if you're not in the state of grace, the, re, the chances of recidivism are tremendous, that you can help this person find liberation and freedom, but until they have the habit. Remember, virtue is a habit. It's an habitual practice. Of good, and so souls that don't have that habit developed over the course of several weeks, several months before they get prayed over. Um, then they don't have they don't have the strength of character of moral character to fight off the temptation after uh, uh, liberation occurs. And the second is retaliation. The real barometer is retaliation. Staying within our armor and 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 working with under the under a priest's authority. Um, and staying within our own bounds, it keeps us from retaliation. I mean, if we get retaliated against, we're all going to get we're all getting retaliated against for the work we're doing um, at, at various points in the apostolate. But the retaliation um, should only be there to show us defects in our own formation, and not deep retaliation against our marriages and our children, et cetera. Dan, I've even heard Father Ripperger says that he's uh, he feels uh, retaliated in some instances. Uh, he said that one day he. Uh, he uh, exercised a kid who was a drug addict, and uh, this guy was steeped in drugs. But uh, you know, he 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 sobered he sobered up. He went through, you know, he 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 adjusted his life. Uh, you know, started living in a state of grace and started coming back to the sacraments. But Father Ripperger says when he did se several sessions, he said in one instance he felt like he was under the influence of drugs for a few hours uh, after yeah. after he uh, he did a session over this one kid, and uh, I think some. Some people call that transference. Have you heard that term, transference? There's a deacon, Guadalupe, from Laredo, Texas, who writes a lot of good articles on spiritual warfare. He calls it transference, uh, that there can be, I guess what you would call retaliation, he defines it as transference. Have you heard that or, term? Or that would be, yeah, transference, we would kind of refer to it as, as diabolic projection. Um, you know, and sometimes you get, when, you know, uh, when the air gets rarefied in a session like that, you might get projections. It could be the projection of what if, it, this could be a projection. If God, if God, if you get hit with a projection or a transference, it's for some purpose. Either there's a defect in your character, character development. There's a moral defect that you need to polish. You need to clean up. You got a you got a leaky spot in the roof, and you need to patch it. Or your God allows you to get this projection. So that you can see where the holding point is. In this case, I, I didn't I haven't heard Father tell that story. But if an exorcist gets hit with that, chances are um, it's so that he can see. Okay, I see where the demon's holding. The demon is projecting something about 
his entry point, his holding point, um, how he entered in. And the priest, again, just takes it prayerfully because it could be deceptive. It could be a lot of things. But, hmm, hmm, it's interesting that we're, we all got hit during this prayer session, particularly the priest, but this or that. Maybe there's something to be said about this. This is, again, charisms working within our vocational constructs. Dan, we're going to have to continue this. Uh, Wednesdays is, go is going to be the audience's favorite uh, show with uh, Dan and, and Kyle Clement. Uh, yeah, there's uh, any any concluding remarks before we wrap it up? Eddie, you got a, uh, one more I mean, thing you want us to mention? No, you know what, Dan, thank you for, for coming on with us. This is, this is so informative. We're just getting all kinds of uh, feedback on that, uh, on how informative it is. And so that's why we want to get into the minutia of everything that, that we're talking about so there's no misunderstanding. Unlike other uh, other uh, models that Model. we've talked about, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a good thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dan, me, me and Eddie yeah. are here taking down notes as as uh, yeah. as uh, Dan's giving some SWAT training, spiritual weapons and tactics. All right, brother. Yeah. We'll, uh, One last quote from the Catechism. Yes, Catechism three ninety five. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. He is only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is pure spirit, but still a creature. Right out of the catechism. It's a creature. He's a person. Amen. But he's not infinite. So, God let's not lose sight of that. Let's come to Jesus first. Let's not lose yeah. sight of that. Dan, I'll, ma I'll make That's sure to, uh, inter Dan, I'm going to make sure to email that uh, passage of the catechism to Father uh, Sosa, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'll care what you and I have to say, but yes, sure. I think, uh, yeah. All right, first. brother. We're 10-7. Thank God you, bless sir. You. God bless you, brothers. Yep. God bless you. Yep. Keep the greasy side down, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> amen brother amen all right jess well that's another that's another awesome uh session we had with uh with these liber cristo uh instructors instructors that uh that that inform us uh, as much as as uh, as anybody else jess this is this stuff is this, this is high level catholicism this, here this stuff is stuff that we are we that are explaining the things that we've done that uh, uh, or why we've done them, you know. I mean, that, that, that's what I, that I'm, I, I'm thinking. I mean, that's why I had the instinct of not liking a particular model that's used out there that yeah. never mentioned Saint Michael or the Virgin Mary. This is the reason. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know that was it, but absolutely, that's that's the problem with it. You know what it was? It was your sensus, sensus fidelium. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's the fact that you're baptized, you're confirmed, you live in a state of grace, and the Holy Spirit is telling you something's wrong with this model, something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Justin, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you what, the, the more we're informed by, by these Libor Cristo guys, uh, I think the more uh, uh, in-depth, the more effective we're going to be, and the holy we're going to be, the more uh, the more able we're going to be to uh, to live a more, uh, a more a virtuous life. That's for sure. And remember, I think the takeaway for today, just remember this, uh, the demon enters through sin Remain and remains through heresy. Through heresy. So remember, learn your faith. Don't be a heretic. That's right. And embrace everything the church teaches. Once you learn it, embrace it. You know, latch onto it like a pet bull latches onto a piece of red meat. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us today at Jesus 911. We'll be back tomorrow. Stand by right now for Gary Matuda and Hands On Apologetics. Again, we, uh, we bless ourselves today with St. Michael's protection and especially the Blessed Virgin Mary. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Careful, thank you. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O oh my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O oh Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.